Mufreds. Last week I finished building this abandoned and neglected Conqueror Mark II from Dragon. It's a model that's been sitting half finished on my shelf for a good 5 years. And now, with the assembly slash disassembly slash destruction part out of the way, it's time to give it a nice rusted out base coat. Here's the model even more disassembled and washed in soapy water. It doesn't look so glorious anymore, but that's just a part of the process. The model has to be completely dry before we start painting, and a small cooling fan works perfectly for that. Note that I added a small securing nut into the hull, that's so I could attach it to my Octopus M2M painting stand. It's a wonderful tool that gives you full access to the model from every possible angle, leaving you with both hands free for something… more productive. It also comes with a different attachment, ideal for grabbing turrets, figures or whatever, something that can't be bolted in place. But what about the small stuff? Well, with random tiny parts, I usually make a small hole somewhere out of sight and super glue a toothpick into that. All the miscellaneous parts can be now kept in one place, and you won't have to touch them during the painting process. Now, to kick things off, this model is gonna need a lot of primer. In fact, more than one kind. Large metal parts are always tricky to paint because stuff just doesn't bite into them as strongly as into plastic, so I like using Mr. Metal Primer to make that problem a no problem at all. It's lacquer based and it covers the metal parts in a nice, glossy layer of something. The point is, paints will hold on primed metal just as well as they do on plastic. With that out of the way, I could now prime the entire model. My favorite primer of all time is Black Mr. Surfacer, but for this model, a dark brown Mr. Mahogany primer is gonna be more suitable. The Conqueror is a massive tank, so it requires a lot of priming, and it was at this moment when I was spraying and breathing all those fumes, of course through a respirator mask with two replaceable particle filters, safety first of course, when I kinda realized how much time you have to spend on a large model. Even something as simple as priming can take an entire hour, if not even more. But the reward is a nice, dark, unified surface with a smooth, chocolate brown finish. That's very important for the next step, which is gonna be a rusty base coat. So to make my own rust tones, I used these two Tamiya paints. I started with the generous coat of Hull Red. It's very similar to the dark brown primer, but with a strong reddish hue. To me it just looks like dark rust, and as such it's an ideal color for rusty finishes. I liked using flat brown in the past for this purpose, but you'll see a direct comparison in this video so you can decide which paint works better. The entire rusty finish was painted using the post shading method. I kept adding more and more flat yellow into hull red, making it lighter and more orange. Each layer was applied in smaller quantities, creating a gradual color gradient, from the darkest rust tone in corners and let's say around details, to a bright orange rust color on the most exposed surfaces. You can play around with your own mixtures as you please, making the finish as light as you want, but it's worth keeping in mind that the rusty undercoat needs to have enough contrast with the chipped paint that's gonna be on top of it. In other words, although I'd love to make a full-blown post-shaded rusty tank with extreme contrast, I had to keep the finish reasonably dark, so the upcoming grey and faded green will be clearly visible. It also depends on the amount of wear and tear on the model. You don't have to spend hours with this step if you're going to use it for lots of small chips, but because I knew this tank had large areas of exposed rusty metal, I wanted to give it some variation. And for that reason, I tried spraying the sheet metal components in a different mixture, flat brown and flat yellow. That's what I was talking about, both colors are okay, but I personally think that hull red gives you a more authentic rusty finish. So that's our base coat. I know it looks very smooth and artificial, like a 3D render with no textures, and we could definitely add those with speckling and some stippling with a sponge, but don't worry, we'll have enough texture with the upcoming layers of chipped paint. And chipped paint means chipping fluid. 
This is a huge surface with lots of worn paint and for that reason I like to play it safe and apply two generous coats of the chipping stuff. Again, a small cooling fan works perfectly for speed drying. The first layer of worn paint is gonna be this medium grey that I mixed from German grey and deck tan. Judging from reference images, I suspect it's a layer of primer on the real tank. So apparently the British folk doesn't like the brown Mr. Surfacer, but instead the grey normie stuff. Yes. Anyway, it's all good stuff, because a grey primer definitely provides more contrast than the more traditional oxide red primer that we often see on German tanks. And it's, in fact, still used to this day on metal surfaces. Also, reference images were crucial during this stage, because I wanted to replicate the worn areas as close to reality as possible. Chipping is a fun task, except when you need to chip a huge model. I know, I'm repeating myself, but really, anyone who's ever painted a large model knows how exhausting it can get. But anyway, hairspray chipping requires a bunch of specific, yet simple tools. Mainly various brushes, ranging from a large, soft brush for moistening the surface and thus activating the chipping fluid, to smaller, stiff brushes, often with cut-down bristles for that hard scrubbing, tapping and just attacking the paint. A toothpick or an old airbrush needle is also essential for long scratches, or if you need to outline a sharp edge. Wearing down a rotting tank with tons of wear is technically pretty easy, because chipping and wear are omnipresent. As such, you can scrub everything pretty hard and the results are guaranteed to look, at the very least, pretty nice and authentic. Those two thick layers of chipping fluid made the task even easier, although in some cases it can get too easy, to a point when it's not even funny and that can lead to uncontrollable results. It's also interesting how the grey primer almost looks like mill scale, something I'll have to be careful about as I start weathering the tank. It needs to be clear that this is not a texture in the steel surface, but a coat of chip primer. And once I was done, after several hours of chipping, I sealed everything with a generous coat of VMS flat varnish. This knocks down the irregular sheen left over by the chipping fluid and also locks everything firmly in place, so the next layer won't affect and reactivate this one. So that's the model with the first layer of worn effects. It honestly looks more like a factory fresh tank ready for priming, but I think the next layer will change that impression. And if by any chance it won't, the upcoming weathering effects will definitely seal the deal. Well, this step is gonna be essentially the same stuff all over again, starting with another double coat of heavy chipping fluid. I'd love to have this stuff in a spray can, because cleaning the airbrush gets tedious after a while, but uh, wait, that would be just regular good old hairspray, right? Anywho, the faded green paint was mixed from these bottles. I started with a generous amount of deck tan and kept adding deep green and yellow green in small drops until I was satisfied with the tone. I tried mixing it as close to color references as possible, although the more I looked at those images, the more impossible the task seemed. There's just way too much color variation, be it color fading from sunlight and rain, subtle dust layers, grime, or even something that looks like fire damage on the back of the turret of one tank. There are just too many effects and variables, and I'll make sure to add all of these in the next video. But the point was to mix a very pale, faded green that would provide a good foundation for all those weathering effects and even better, enough contrast with the rusty tank and the chipped primer. A lot of you, my friends, told me in my recent videos that I should make some in-depth segmented series again, where I have more time to talk about small nuances, techniques and stuff, right? So here we go. <laughs> These stiff bristled brushes are the absolute best for heavy wear. I always buy them in a paint store. They're originally intended for detail painting on walls, such as around windows or door frames, but they become softer once you dip them in tap water for a few times. So they're not so stiff bristled anymore. And that really sucks, because they lose their awesomeness and uber chipping qualities. But on the other hand, they're dead cheap, so it's worth having a bunch of them at hand. 
Also, the often aggressive scrubbing can really affect the paint and that's why a good quality primer is so important. Mr. Surfacer is probably the most durable primer I ever worked with and if it wasn't for the metal primer, you can be sure that I'd be chipping all the way down to the brass photo wedge on this model or the giant shiny aluminum shl I mean gun barrel. <laughs> And to seal the deal, quite literally, I gave the model another generous coat of VMS flat varnish. I had barely enough to finish this model, so VMS, if you're watching this, hit me up. So here we go, my friends, the base coat is finished. I know, it looks pretty wild, in fact it looks absolutely crazy, but I believe it's a good base for playing around with oils and enamels. But hey, we can always add some more airbrush stuff. When it comes to sprayed markings, and we're not talking about stencils, I like to have some chipping fluid underneath for um, safety reasons. For example, this scrappy art number didn't go as well as I hoped it would. It almost looks like as if I did it on purpose, but no, this is how clumsy I really am. And if it wasn't for the chipping fluid, I'd be ripping my hair out right now, but this way I can get rid of it completely and start with a clean slate. But the fluid also works as a liquid mask. It'll take a few more lifetimes until I become skilled enough with an airbrush to pull off hand sprayed letters and numbers, but until then, I have to rely on chipping fluid to get rid of the excessive overspray. The option of adding a worn, greedy appearance is just a small additional benefit, but yeah, add chipping fluid before you start spraying if you're not confident. And the nice pale finish, at least in those places with some leftover paint, is a great canvas for post shading. I like to do as much work with an airbrush as possible and ammo shaders are excellent for making the model look more interesting. All of these effects can be added with oil paints of course, but that would take hours and hours of precious time, so why not make our lives easier and more enjoyable if we have the tools for that, right? Anyway, there's a ton of color variation on the real tank as I already said, and I'll add the remaining effects in the next video, so here's the finished base coat for now. I could definitely add the heavy grimy residue and fire damage using an airbrush, but I have to make the next video exciting as well, right? Anyway, the last step was blackening the tracks using VMS Black Track Pro 2.0. There was no electricity on my street when I was filming this and the strong sunlight from the window isn't exactly ideal for filming in studio conditions, but at least you can somehow see how it went. This is how they look after I washed them in soapy water and left them to dry. Another awesome foundation for weathering. So m friends, here's our heavily worn down base coat. Painting a tank in this type of finish was on my bucket list for this year and although it wasn't my true intention at this very moment, the circumstances just led me to it. I knew I wanted to get rid of a large shelf queen and a large box in my stash and it was just a coincidence that I wanted to paint this tank as a rusty hulk. Honestly, the two layers of chipping were more tedious than fun because it's a huge model, so if you're craving a nice rusted out model, do yourself a favor and try it on a smaller model. When I compare it to the Volkswagen Beetle I did not so long ago, that was a total blast and by the time I was sealing this base coat with the final layer of flat varnish, I was already finishing the Beetle and thinking about its scenic base. Talk about putting things into perspective, right? So what's coming up next, you might ask? Well, lots of weathering. Pin washes, some dry brushing with a dark rusty color, lots of enamel rust effects, streaks of grime, dust residue, natural scatter and probably some moss, because why not? It's gonna be heaps of fun, so I hope you'll join me for that. In the meantime, Thank you for watching my friends and thank you to my awesome patrons who make this show possible. If you like what I'm doing, wanna get more of it and in return support my work, you can go to my Patreon page and see what kind of reward would you like. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench, we can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. I'm posting one week early ad free videos so you could watch the weathering process right now. I also have some small 3D models for detailing your models and dioramas, a bunch of references from the real world if you need inspiration for old buildings, landscapes and so on, and these beautiful studio photos which you can download in full resolution. 
All right, m dear friends, I hope this video felt more complete than the previous one when I was just finishing a half-built Conqueror. I'm stoked for the weathering on this one because a rusty, rotting vehicle of any sort is a ton of fun and anything you can think of is technically plausible. Oh, and I'm already starting to form an idea about a scenic base for this model, but that's gonna take a while. Until then, you all stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!